you know, philosophy the, in, in Ghanaian universities is one of the things you study. I did philosophy in first year and then I dropped it because mostly the questions you get, what are you going to use philosophy for? Like, so I wonder what you would tell, um, first of all, people do say to us, like, we're Africans, we're not, we don't have to answer life questions. This is not our thing. So is African philosophy a real thing? Is, is it a thing? Um, I could just say yes and stop there, but you probably want me to say more than that. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, uh, Actually, Ghana has a special place, I think, in African philosophy because some of the most important uh, late 20th century, early 21st century philosophers in the English-speaking world working in uh, Africa are Ghanaians. Uh, uh, Kwesi Wiridu, uh, Kwame Jechi, uh, to name two very prominent examples. And of course, Willie Abram, who was the philosopher who worked most closely with Nkrumah, is also a very distinguished philosopher. Um, philosophy can mean a bunch of different things uh, in one sense of philosophy where it's what's your philosophy, what's your, how do you think about life, of course everybody has a philosophy. Um, they may not be able to articulate it very well, they may not have, think, they may, may not even recognize that they've got it, but you, you've got, you know, all the time you're making choices and those choices reflect a view about the relative importance of family and self. Uh, your country and your private interest, and so on. You know, that's just sort of built into human life. You've got to make choices and you have to have some way of making them. In that, uh, in that sense, everybody has a philosophy. But in the sense of, um, and it's not just that that's true, but you know, there are hundreds of languages in Africa, perhaps more than a thousand, and in every language there are going to be concepts that are distinctive. Um, the ways in which people who speak uh, the Akan languages think about the soul and so on. We have these two words, kra and sumsum. Yeah, sum -sum. Yeah. Uh, there's only one word for that in English, soul. <laughs> soul. <laughs> so how do we have two words? Well, that's a philosophical question and, and people Why like... Why are you giving me something to chew on? <laughs> yeah, so I think, and that's something that both Wiridu and Jetchi and a whole lot of other people also Willie Abram have written about, I've written about it for that matter. Um, so I think that that's, that kind of philosophical reflection rooted in African traditions of thought is also a very big deal. It's, it's been very well developed in Ghana, but um, it, it, there's lots of work of this sort in, in uh, Yoruba in Nigeria. There are plenty of East Africans who've thought about these things. Uh, and there's a huge body of work now in Southern Africa uh, motivated by an interest in Ubuntu, Ubuntu yeah. uh, which again is drawing on African traditions of thought to make philosophy just as the Greeks drew on Greek traditions of thought to make philosophy and so on and one of the nice things about that I think is that is that philosophy as a global discourse is now a conversation between people speaking from different places and we're all learning from each other. Um, uh, Chrissy Burdo has a nice example of this um, which is that he says that uh, the, the sort of Western tradition of thinking about the relationship between the mind and the body, um, which is, has been dominated for many centuries by the thinking of a French philosopher called Descartes. Oh, I, um, think I, I think therefore I am. Good. So that's Descartes. He thinks that the idea of separating the mind and the body, which is definitely what uh, Descartes wanted to do, is very hard to do if you speak tree. <laughs> because it's natural to think that the, the personality and the thought of a person is in their body or their brain. Uh, it's natural, that is, for an Akan speaker. And so some of, the things that, um, some of the things that people are inclined to say in Western philosophy about the mind-brain thing, if you just try to translate them into tree, they, they seem weird. So there's a case where our language, I think, and, and now, of course, that wouldn't, be, um, that wouldn't be a great source of reassurance if you thought that the, the, the Akan way of thinking about it was wrong. You'd just say, well, our language has given us the wrong idea. But I actually think the Akan way of thinking about it is right, and the Western Cartesian way of thinking about it is wrong. Oh, you think so? Absolutely. I'm, uh, I mean, I don't think it's wrong because it's Western, I, or, and I don't think the other view is right because it's Ghanaian. I think if you just think about it in the right way, you can see 
that there's a, there are deep problems in the ways in which Descartes and his successors dealt with this. And by the way, um, one of the first people to point this out, who I will talk about in my wreath lecture in Accra, is a man called Anton Wilhelm Amu, who is a Ghanaian, who wrote about Descartes in the 18th century, 1730s and 40s, and who made criticisms of the way Descartes treated issues to do with perception that I myself find quite compelling. So I'm, uh, it happens, but by purest chance, that one of the people, he didn't have much influence. Uh, I mean, he was a professor of philosophy in Germany for a while. He didn't have the kind of influence of some other philosophers whose names we know, but he made arguments that I think address exactly some of the weaknesses in, um, in the Cartesian view of how the mind and the body relate, which would lead you in the end to say that you, you have to reject the Cartesian view. You have to have a view in which mind and body are much more intimately connected. So, just an example. That's, that's um, interesting. So I wonder if, now that we're saying there's um, Western philosophy and African philosophy and you have endorsed African philosophy, I'm going to go out there and argue with my friends. But I, I wonder what you think about um, things like, so there are new ideas. Um, like Afropolitanism, Afrofuturism. I wonder what you think about these things that young Africans are reflecting on. Well, I, so I have written a little bit about Afropolitanism because I'm interested in cosmopolitanism and I'm interested in African philosophy. Um, I guess the sh short answer is I think that Afropolitanism is a kind of discourse that rises out of the situation of young and now some not so young <laughs> people who are who live in 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 a way that is somewhat diasporic they live they have a home in in Nigeria or in or in Ghana or in Kenya or somewhere but they also have a root a foot somewhere else and so what it is, is a distinctive take on what it is to be a citizen of the world. Um, so the riff is on cosmopolitan, and cosmopolitan is, is just from the Greek cosmopolites, which means citizen of the world. Um, it's a riff on that, and the thought, it's just, it's just that there's a kind of African accent to being a citizen of the world. So these are people who are, they may be living in Atlanta, or London, or Frankfurt, or Amsterdam, uh, but they, they come home and they think of themselves as citizens of some African country, but also as having some other kinds of connections. So what's first for you among your identities is often a matter of context. It depends on who else is around and so on. So I would say that even the people who think that they're Asante first would probably find themselves defending somebody from the north of Ghana or, some, or an Ewe or a Ga person uh, before they would defend a Nigerian. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, so we do, so especially outside, in the world outside. So I think there is a, uh, we shouldn't assume that just because somebody mentions an identity first in one context, it doesn't, it isn't going to come up second in some other context where which is different um, do, do should we worry that people say they're first of all um, um, I, so say I, I, I can before, before I I'm going in yes um, uh, whether we should worry about that depends on um, what they're going to do about it so you know people know how to do that people live every Ghanaian knows how to do that because every Ghanaian has an ethnic yeah. sense and a, a sense of themselves to some degree as a Ghanaian and, and also as a Muslim or something more specific, a Sunni Muslim, a Shia Muslim, uh, a, a Presbyterian, a Catholic, a Methodist, an Anglican, and those are important too. So I think people can handle these things. Occasionally it gets difficult, obviously if you were born into a, you know, if you, were, if you were half German and half English in 1939, 
Well, then that would have been hard. But that doesn't happen very often. And most of the time, I think... So I, I would say most Ghanaians, they, they may not use the word identity, uh, but they have questions about identity all the time. Another set of questions about identity, which I think all Ghanaians have, um, are going to be questions about the relationship between men and women. Those are identity questions. And that's, uh, that's another area where there's been huge change in the course of my lifetime, even in the course of your much shorter lifetime. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's, been, there's, been, there's been a huge change, and it's, it's been the result of people asking the kinds of questions you ask about identities. What goes with this identity? What should a person of this identity do and not do? How should a person of this identity uh, support people of this identity? Uh, should they always do so, or should they sometimes draw back? Um, when is my identity as a woman or a man relevant, and when isn't it? Right? Those are questions that you... you now, you, you can ask all those questions without using the word identity, but you have those questions. Right? Right.